<laughs> All right. Um, so my thought is that um, there's a big long list of questions over here that I didn't erase any of them off the board, and I should get to it now before we get in the midst of our twice as long handout for today. Um, so I'm going to start knocking off topics here, or going through them all, and uh, hopefully the people who were who asked them are present, um, and we'll just see see where where it goes. Um, uh, biochar. I think we talked about biochar yesterday, to some degree at least. Was there more questions? I have yes. a question about mineralization and inoculation and that sort of thing. Of biochar. Of biochar. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get it into the through the eighth-inch screen, and uh, then what do I do? I what I have done is mixed it with worm compost. Mm -hmm. I have the problem of being in a neighborhood where I come under criticism and judgment and county censure if I don't do things in a very neat and orderly way. Yes. And so to have compost piles and heaps and some of this stuff is becoming more and more difficult for me. And yes. I haven't been able to afford massive fencing. Yes. I'm tempted to put the eight-foot fence out on the street and all the way around and say, you all stay yeah. out of my business, that I can't afford that. Bamboo. But back to buy shop. <laughs> Bamboo. So there you go. It's so invasive, though, I uh, would yeah. not go there and do that. <laughs> No. If you've got a small area, you can keep it cut back. Uh, whatever. Some kind of a hedgerow might be, might be valuable. What I've attempted to do in yes. the preparation of raw biochar for the garden, mm -hmm. because I need to keep it in an enclosed space, I put it in the bottom of a plastic barrel, 50-50 with the worm compost. Mm -hmm throw in a cup full of molasses and try to keep it aerated. Mm -hmm. And hope that in two weeks or so that pro all the process there will be ready and I can deploy it. Yeah. Are you making the worm compost? Yes. Yeah. Do you have uh, juice, worm juice coming out of the bottom of the worm bins? No, this is an in-ground okay. system. But and are you mixing it up, mixing the, the worm compost with the, with the biochar? I have, I've only begun putting the biochar in the worm bin. Yeah. When you put when you put the biochar in and then the worm compost on top, are you mixing it up or are you just leaving it layered? Everything that goes into the worm bin gets mixed before it goes in. No, no, no. The bio, you said what you, you're putting the biochar in with worm castings on top and let, letting it sit for two weeks. And this is in a barrel. Yes. Where I stir it morning Fine. and evening. Great. To keep the bacteria aerated so yeah, they yeah, yeah. can live and multiply from the sugars I put in. I think you're probably doing just fine. I wouldn't be too concerned. So that's my question. Is that yeah. the right? Can I Good have enough. I generally that recommend that people. I generally in. recommend that people put their um, biochar into their compost piles when they're making their compost piles and. You don't necessarily need to fence off your whole property to have a little fence where your compost piles can be made and people can't see it. But um, I think what you're going through sounds like it's close enough to good enough. I wouldn't be too concerned. Okay. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> the idea in general for people who are not familiar with biochar, just to re 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 um, repeat from yesterday, is that biochar is like a big empty tank. And when you put a big empty tank into your garden, it'll try to fill itself from what's already in the garden. And the functional effect from raw biochar is that you can have a crop you know, decrease for the first couple of years. And so you're trying to fill the tank before you put it into the garden. And so mixing it with compost or putting it into a compost pile or putting it in a five gallon bucket and peeing into the bucket, there's all kinds of things you can do to help fill the biochar pore spaces before you put it into the soil. That's the short. The analogy is the sponge. Yes. Or the microbial reef. I like the reef analogy. Well, there's that too. Yes. Um, but it is a sponge. The nature of sponges is that they give and take. Yes. And they absorb and they release. Yeah. And this is what the biochar does. Precisely. With minerals and with um, 
Nice it's got this nice, wonderful pore space where the bacteria and the fungi can sort of move in and mm -hmm. sporulate, and it'll serve as a, a wonderful inoculant mm -hmm. moving forward. It's quite nice stuff, if you're willing wonderful. to move. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, cover crops is a big topic, which did not come up yesterday in any kind of significant mm -hmm. um, manner and um, deserves a lot of time. Um, um, I w let me just give you a quick overview of, of my general comments on cover crops, and then we'll see if there's questions. Um, I like to uh, put my cover crops in uh, to my annual cropping ground uh, when my crops are still growing strong. Um, I generally aim for the end of August or beginning of September where I live. Um, maybe you talk about a little bit later down here. Um, generally, what we have, is, you know, climactically is a uh, quite dry period um, through July into August. And then we begin to have tropical storms and hurricanes and a little more activity in the in the clouds with rain. So I really am just looking for the first, you know, major wet period that's gonna come through starting at the end of August through into September. And I broadcast my cover crops right into the mulch duff that's underneath my tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, squash, cucumbers, kale, chard, broccoli, everything. Uh, any, the, I don't usually put them into carrots and beets. I don't put the cover crops into the um, <clears throat> salad greens, but just about everything else. Anything that's been transplanted in, that's got some space between it. I want to have those cover crops starting to grow um, and at a good height by the time the frost comes and kills my plants or by the time I'm pulling out my last um, whatever they are. What are you broadcasting? What's that? What are you broadcasting? What, I mean, that's the next, next point. Um, but the first point is that I'm not waiting till the end of the growing season. I'm not pulling the crops out. I'm not harrowing the ground and then planting cover crops. I'm planting the cover crops right into the crops as they're growing a good month plus before we would expect them to be done. I would like my cover crops to be a foot and a half tall, two feet tall by the time my crops are done. There's no reason to have, um, to be seeding cover crops so late in the fall that they don't really get a chance to grow and have any significant benefit. Might as well get them in and get them established and let them um, you know, really, really grow up nicely underneath, <coughs> underneath most things. And you're just throwing, broadcasting that seed right on top of the mulch. And so what happens when I put the mulch down, which we will talk about shortly here, the process of getting things into the ground, um, in the springtime is that generally that mulch will get eaten up by the soil life and there's not much left by that time of the year. Sometimes yeah. we'll actually need to re-mulch in July because there's so much biological activity that it just mm -hmm. disappears. But by that period of the time, by the end of August, by the beginning of September, there's usually just a little bit of duff left on the ground. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I, the reason I'm waiting for a wet, a wet period is because I'm not going to be harrowing in, I'm not going to be disking in, I'm not going to be going through in any kind of a manner to get good soil contact with those seeds. And if I don't have sufficient moisture for a couple of days and cloudy kind of weather, they're not going to germinate. Um, uh, one thing you can do, which we'll talk about again in a moment, is soaking seed. And I would generally suggest soaking that seed ahead of time as well will, will, will help. But if you've got a little bit of mulch and you can, you know, disturb it a little bit, put the seeds down and disturb it, they'll fall in and they'll sort of have a little bit of a safer, you know, more moist environment to begin to germinate. Yes? Two years ago, I started doing exactly what you're saying. Yes. And I found out that if I throw the seed in there, yeah. vetch and uh, rye is what I've been using. Yeah. And, and then just till over very shallow. Yeah. It not only digs up whatever weeds I have missed, it yeah. gives the it gives seed them the a really cover. good start. Yeah. And you can just leave it at that point and it's ready. If you if you have the space between your plants to I do have more that, space than you between then them. that's perfect. Yeah. But the idea is you're under sowing the cover crops into your established crops. This is the first the first major point I want to convey, which is a little bit different than I think what oftentimes is conveyed about cover cropping, is that there's no reason I see to do a fall tillage, pull your crops out, disc them under whatever you do, take them, put them in a compost pile, and then put, put your cover crops in. You can get an extra month and a half of growth, you know, which is much better growth in August and September than it's gonna be in October and November. But you just don't get that growth in October and November that you would get in August and September. You wanna have a nice, a nice you know, stand of cover crops that's, that's established that's gonna be, if it's winter kill stuff, it's gonna lay down and be a nice mulch layer. If it's, if it's overwintering, it's got a good, um, good root system, et cetera. Yes. I have a similar question in this regard. So we have a section on, on the farm that's a problem area that we've been taking that we're going to take out of production. Yeah. Uh, it went into a fall cover crop last year. I did what you actually just said. I oversowed uh, all of our root crops later in the season. Got 
not a yep. pretty poor establishment, but there is a good amount of rye and Austrian winter peas and I think some crimson clover in there. Yeah. So I want to continue Wonderful. that cover crop going past this that stand, and um, I bought sweet clover, mm -hmm. and I want to. I'm trying to figure out because I don't want to. I don't want to wait until I have to mow and till in um, the rye to establish the sweet clover because it'll often be too late to get a good sand of clover going. And you might have weed pressure. With right. The weed, so with the clover what too. I'm thinking about doing is over sowing mm -hmm. that area with the sweet clover before I mow. Mm -hmm. But what I'm afraid of is once I go through and flail mow it, that I'll smother that um, clover, whether it's come up or not. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions of Depends on how thick the stand is. You need frost you seed it in the spring. It's too late for frost seeding. Right, it's too late for now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think... Did you say something? Did you say something? I think you got a flail mower, like... Yeah. But you could, you know, you could flail mower and then try to just go and handle How big of an area is it? It's small. There are 75 foot beds and there's eight of them. I think if you broadcasted and then flail mowed, that... that, um, that um, material would be a nice cover to help it germinate. Okay. Um, I would probably aim for, a, again, aim for a wet period right. um, and maybe do it right before the wet period. Okay. Um, but you would but do it before, instead of like, because I was even considering doing it like now, like this coming week. Um, I don't know, if depending on how thick the rye is, there, it'll, it'll, it won't, won't be enough sunlight for the clover to get established, established. I would okay. think. I don't think you would necessarily need to till under the rye either. We'll talk about the, that just momentarily, the logistics of when you knock the rye down and all that kind of stuff. And you're maybe dealing with the milk stage and crimping and all that kind of thing. Um, but if you're going to go from cover crop to cover crop, I, yeah, why are you doing crimson clover as opposed to other cover crops? Well, I wanted to do sweet clover because it's a oh, sweet bi clover. biennial, yeah. um, high biomass, and deep tap roots. So that's what it, we're going for. So it really it has really poor drainage. Yeah. Um, in the past, we've we've done um, for summer cover crops, we've done sorghum sudan mixed with uh, tillage radish. Yeah. And it's actually worked really well. I was going to say I was going to really say tillage yeah. radish should probably be really good if you got tight. That combination has been really nice for us because once we get that dye down from the sorghum, yeah. the tillage radish in our area really takes off for about two months. It would you really. You put some calcium. <clears throat> Or they call them iron clay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If you want to she knows more about cover crops than I do, and probably other people in the room do as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you're on a good trajectory. I'm not sure if your question's been answered or not. No, I think that's another issue. The timing issue. That's another issue. Yeah, the break down, when you mow and you've got that uh, for a couple of weeks there, the, uh, isn't it? They yeah. say the rye lilopathy is sprouting? more when it's younger than when it's older, when it's gone into the milk stage, I don't think the allopathic effect is quite strong, no? Yeah, I mean, I, I've owned, yeah. I've never actually, I've planted rye for the allopathic effect for okay. weed control, yeah. but yeah. then when we establish like soybean or something into it, mm -hmm. the germ, if you get the minerals in the bio, you know, if you give that seed a good start, especially if you can inoculate it, like, then it should germinate pretty well. Yeah, I haven't had the. I think I think the issue is more when it's younger. It was than a when question we were trying to research, like should you wait yeah. or not wait, mm -hmm. you know? But I don't yeah. want to be. Honest. Yeah. So just for my clarification. Yes. <laughs> what are two or three? We're having these? sophisticated question conversation <laughs> here, and like <laughs> rudimentary conversation. <laughs> oh, up and down, back yeah, and forth. So <laughs> finish your basic introduction first, and then we'll go to the sophisticated <laughs> questions. Two, what should you put into the cover crop mix? Two or three of the preferred cover crops would be. Right. So um, for me, there's, there's two different types of mixes that you're going to be thinking about. One is your uh, winter killing cover crop mix, and one is your overwintering cover crop mix. And as, if you're dealing with an annual vegetable kind of a situation, um, there are things that you want to be putting into the ground in the spring um, before the you know, frost is passed. And then there's things you're going to be wanting to put in later after the frost has passed. And so um, <clears throat> things that are going in now, you know, your, your brassicas, your you know, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, cabbage, uh, your chard, your beets, your carrots, your spinach, your peas, your onions, all that's carrots, beets, all the things that are going in earlier, um, wherever those are going to be put in, I would suggest you would want to be doing a, a winter killing cover crop mix in the fall. Um, the idea is to minimize tillage and um, in many cases, you know, obviate the need for tillage. You should not need to till if you do the cover crop 
strategy well. Um, what I've been, so I'll just give an example. So the things that, that winter kill, I'm not sure if they winter kill down here. It got decently cold. It gets down to what down here? Had frost this morning. On my Twenty car. is not cold. <laughs> Fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen. I think I saw it eight one time, but oh, really we had eight two yeah, weeks ago. <laughs> Sorry, last week. Oh, it was still last week. Six what? degrees we had in northern Nelson County. I don't know when these. I think I think most of your winter killers will die in that kind of a temperature. But 15, they might not. Oats, uh, field peas. I have um, mixed results with oats dying or not dying. Right. This is so. I don't know. And four radishes. Do they make it through the winter? No. 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 Four yeah. radishes die. 15 degrees. Yeah. Well, but these guys are saying the 20 is as cold as it well, gets somewhere. No, it, got to eight. It, got to eight. it got to eight yeah. once. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. I am down south. She's, <laughs> a she's a little more toward the coast. So she's a little more yeah, I'm a little warm than yeah. Louisa. We're seven and a half. Yeah. All right. So I can't speak then exactly to the nuances of what are the winter killing cover crops and the not winter killing cover crops. In my experience, things like oats, things like field peas, things like forage radishes, all will winter kill. And that's a wonderful mix to put down for uh, the areas where you want to put in your spring, your spring, spring crops. When you say um, field peas, you don't mean Australian? Not winter peas. Okay, so they don't want to kill. They don't want to kill. Just the summer field peas. Field peas, yeah, that you can put in. Um, so the, one of the basic principles on cover crops is that you want to have a polyculture, if at all possible. Now, traditionally, when I grew up, we would do rye, and that would be great. That, or we would do buckwheat, or we would do oats but we would never do the polyculture thing. And one of the pieces of wisdom from the permaculture community is that the more families of plants you've got growing together, the broader the spectrum of life in the soil, the, you know, the better the function of the overall community, soil life community. Um, um, the term cocktail cover crops refers to this you know, concept, which is being popularized by the NRCS now very successfully and is really, I think, being taken on by a lot of real farmers, quote unquote, in the Midwest where 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 species mixes are being planted and they're having, you know, they really do have amazing, amazing effects. So for people who want to look this stuff up in greater detail, I think, you know, the term cocktail cover crop is probably a good thing <coughs> to look up. Um, I don't know what the resources are down here for, um, I just don't know the exact temperatures for winter killing. Um, I would use, like for me, three different families of plants that are going to be all winter killers would be oats and field peas and forage radishes and they would have a nice basic um, spectrum. Um, a friend of mine was doing some research and he said basically <clears throat> three families of plants is your minimum for that real um, biological vitality effect. Um, one or two is not enough, three is your minimum. Ideally you're looking for more if possible, but um, <clears throat> if you're wanting to not be doing tillage in the spring or doing as little as possible, you really want to make sure that your winter killing mixes are you know, that your, that mix has got all winter killers in it. Otherwise you might have to come through and do some tillage depending on the size of your operation. Oh yeah, I was just thinking if you're doing not winter kill, also you want to make sure that what you plant, even if it's a mixture, is going to mature about the same time if you're not thinking mm -hmm. to it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of issues here. Yes. And, and opportunities. Is it true that um, if, you're, if you're planting yeah. those three or more, and all three um, or more are inoculated with bacteria that they're each going to, you know, the, the, the further apart those plants are related, mm -hmm. the, the different work they're going to do with different bacteria and fungi that are potentially in that inoculum, right? Yes, exactly. So, Not just bacteria in the inoculum, hopefully there's fun, fungal yeah. families and bacterial fun families right. in the broad spectrum inoculum. Yeah. Yes. And they're going to establish more well with different families and help establish that broader spectrum. Precisely. Okay. So if you're wanting to use seed as a, as a you know, least change for the greatest effect kind of influence on the farm, then, yes. then having a cover crop cocktail as well inoculated would be a great way to Would be a brilliant yes. thing to do. Yeah. And oh, one of the most, this is what Fukuoka, whoever was bringing up Fukuoka yesterday, um, the One Star Revolution, he came down to like making these little seed pellets with a little bit of clay with you know, a little bit of sea salt, with an oculant that he would make, mm -hmm. and like, we can save the world with this. End of conversation. Like, fly over with planes and broadcast this stuff into areas where it's desertified, and we can literally, with seed, with a little bit of an oculant, with a little bit of salt, with some, with some trace elements, with the clay, with some minerals, like, we can revitalize the planet. 
that was what he came down to. It's a really inspiring message and extraordinarily simple um, and very, very empowering. Um, uh, very, very inexpensive. And we could really do amazing things with something that simple. Yes? Value added benefit? The uh, <coughs> pea shoots and tendrils are delicious. Awesome. We add them in our salad mix. Yes. Yeah. And field radish, forage radish, tastes damn good too. Yes, exactly. They typically, pull small ones out, put them in their CSA boxes. Uh, they call they call them daikons. Yeah. Well, you they know. are <laughs> they're, 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 they're You can sell them as yeah. daikon they if you want. <laughs> yes, for, yeah. Ours don't look Big like the pretty ones they're in the store. Big. They're not tall and straight. And yeah. Whatnot, but they're really nice in the salad. They exactly. Cook, they cook well and they eat, in the springtime, all that stuff is coming in, and that's like amazing fresh salad greens. Yeah. And if you've got a market where you can sell that kind of stuff, and then the, the flower shoots you can yeah. pick, and the fancy chefs pay for the flower shoots. Um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there. What were you going to say? Okay. I got online last night and ordered white clover. Yes. That's white clover for my spirit fish. Yes. I'm going to take a leaf and do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting ready to plant, I'm high-tone grower. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have 10 beds, and I'm getting ready to put tomatoes and peppers in. Yes. In the tunnels. Mm -hmm. They're there. Yeah. I've already put in all my molasses and the whole mix yeah. in there. I'm wondering if I can if I can broadcast the white clover mm -hmm. and then plant the tomatoes in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But the white clover is a perennial. Mm -hmm. So once I do that I'm dedicating those beds to white clover. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Pretty much. But then when it depends I on what you're planting in your salad greens. My yeah. lettuces and kale and things mm -hmm. in the fall. Yeah. I could just plant right in that? Uh, well, your kale and stuff wouldn't mind probably, but the lettuces, you're doing baby green size or no, full I'm heads? No, small butterheads. Yeah. I don't know. I could do those. Too I, have, tight. I have 25 beds. So too I much could, competition. I've got, I, could I think with the, with the smaller plants, it's going to be too tight. Mm -hmm. um, with the tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, it would be a wonderful understory. Cabbages would work? Mm, probably. Yeah. yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. things that you're going to give a couple feet to. Are no, going to be fine. I could leave those beds for tomatoes and cabbages in the larger. Or beds. you could, or you could till under your right, your 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 clover, when you put in your 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 salad greens in. Um, it's you know it's going to be beneficial. Just till it in under. the growing season, anyways. Um, till it under if you keep it in the pathways, depending on where it is. It, it's in the pathways, it'll move back up. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. a pathway. It's going to be in beds. <coughs> Why not have it in the pathways too? Make a thing I like a bulb here. planner. Oh. In my password. What's that? Make a tool, make a tool like a bulb kind of planter. Take a tin can, cut I off have the edge, plan. sharp. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you need a little bigger than that. And just cut a, a plug out to get that clover out, and then you can put your plant right into there, and it won't have enough competition at the time until the clover grows back in for like your mm -hmm. head lettuces and stuff. What a great idea! But her butterheads but, are going to be pretty you, close you, together, and just be taken out. Hard to pull that stuff out. It'll be a significant amount of work. Rise of, Rhizomus, but it's not that terrible. But I'm going to be brave mm -hmm. enough to put ten beds of clover in. Mm -hmm. Even if it's and only in, even if it's only in for the next four or five months, it's yeah. it's going to be beneficial. Yeah. yeah, it'll be totally beneficial. Mm -hmm. Experiment, right? I would say That's we were having we've been having this conversation. We don't really know that much, <laughs> right? We don't really know the answers to these questions, and there's a lot of people who are doing a little bit here and a little bit there and experimenting and trying this out. And there's no discussion about. Cover cropping in high tunnels. Right. Other than taking it out of production, which yeah. cost of high tunnel doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. You've got yeah. to grow all year round. Understory in the uh, understories is what nature does. Nature does multiple, multiple, you know. Right, um, I'm on. Ten go for it. Right Experiment. Mm -hmm. The idea of the organization, I'll just say this over and over again. The idea of the organization is that if we get people to you know, say this makes sense and try it out and they get results, then they can tell everybody else what their responses were, and we've got a feedback loop where we're all learning together instead of all learning alone. My experience is there's a lot of good people out there trying stuff out, a lot of good people finding out a lot of really interesting mm -hmm. stuff, and we don't have the, the system in place for people to share their wisdom and pass on that best, best practices. We, it's really embarrassing. You know, a lot of people are coming back to farming after a couple of generations of not being in, in, on the land, and a lot of the wisdom that was there is not is, is gone, is lost. And we need to re-educate ourselves. And the best way to do it is if we can op, you know, crowdsource the learning. So, um, right, yes, the, the you're, you're signed up. I do have a lot to talk about today. You guys are wonderful in your level of engagement. I've only got like 20 topics I wanted to deal with, and we're still on number two. And I haven't even finished explaining it. So just so we're clear, I'm going to have to rush at some point.
best source for intensive vegetables and constant yes. cover cropping is Tobacco Road Farm in Connecticut. Brian O'Hara is a wonderful grower. Yeah. Brian O'Hara is a wonderful grower. Oh, yeah. He was at my house last week. Yeah. He's absolutely a wonderful grower. And one thing we haven't talked about much is the whole biodynamics aspect right. and the uh, Lebanon, Connecticut. Yeah, Tobacco Road Farm. Yeah, I don't know how much is online. From he him, is absolutely but, not but he online. He does not do here. internet. He does not. You you either call him or you send him a, a letter. He's a great. He's a great guy. I've got his phone yeah, number right here. <laughs> we were taking a road trip. We got <laughs> we got a van. <laughs> We'd like to come up and see you. <laughs> yes. Raised beds, are mm -hmm. they that beneficial or not? I mean, By raised beds, you mean with balls? Yeah, well, no, no, when you till. And a little you, divot. And you, rake, you just throw the dirt up in more of a hill. How often do you get, you know, um, hurricanes that drop six or eight inches? Almost never around here. Almost never. It's a crapshoot then. It depends on your layer of your land, if you're low and wet, if you, I mean, if you got. If you've got a high and dry area, maybe it's less necessary. For me, it's wonderful to keep your foot traffic in the pathway and no pressure on the bed. I want my bed, bed to be as spongy and loose as possible. Um, if you want to hear me bark, all you have to do is step on my bed. Mm -hmm. Hey, get off the bed. <laughs> Don't step on my ground. So it's really helpful to have, this is where you're walking, and that's not where you're walking. Um, we have, I mean, we have hurricanes. I'm guessing you guys have we hurricanes. Have, we, yeah. do. Yeah. we do. We, we, do. Get, we get, get the rain. rain. Get you don't we get, get 10 inches. Yeah. yeah. Once or twice a year. Well, my experience has been when the when the ground is flat and you get a couple thunderstorms or a hurricane that drop a bunch of rain, um, things really get anaerobic fast and plants stop growing. And I had so, a six-inch rain in my house last year and a four-inch rain in my house last year. Yeah. I know what happens. My plants all blanch out and they are yellow. So I pay attention to these things. I, I think a raised bed with an irrigation system will get you through drought and flood. And with the climate being as irregular as it is, I suggest that that's probably something to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. It's your business. I won't tell you what to do. Um, as far as the non-winter killing cover crops, um, you know, rye is your classic one. Um, vetch is great. Uh, various clovers, um, depending on what your Intentions are, I mean, there are just dozens and dozens of wonderful cover crops. Um, um, the idea with the, with the rye, anybody who's tried to till under rye in the spring, um, I grew up on a farm where we did that. We had a little, you know, walk behind Troy Built Rototiller, and we'd spend most of the spring out there going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, trying to kill the rye. Rye is a remarkably vigorous, vital, vibrant, powerful plant. I think they did on the math on rye, like how many miles of root one rye plant has, it's miles, right? I mean, they're just absolutely amazing. Um, but the rye, like most annual grasses, has this stage in its life called the milk stage, which is basically, we talked about this yesterday, after the flower is pollinated, before the seed is viable, at which point the plant, um, all you have to do is literally kink the stem, bend the stem, um, and it'll die. Um, so the rye seed won't form and become a weed, and you can actually lay it down, and then you can come through with your hoe and chop a hole, or your planter, and you can put your transplants in, you can put your seeds in right into that rye mulch, basically, with the root systems in place. And with very little till, with no tillage, you know, transfer from an overwintering cover crop to a summer planted crop um, with very little soil disturbance. Your issue is, you know, with your um, clover or your vetch, things that are not necessarily going to get killed by that process. How far apart are they? How big are the seeds you're putting in? Um, there's logistics. To deal with. At what point did you say you could kink the rye and not have it come After the flower is pollinated, before the seed is viable, it's called the milk stage, right. and it's milk because you squeeze the head and you get a white fluid that comes out of the head where the seed will be. It's a white milky fluid. That's called the milk stage. It's like a week or 10 days long. Um, look it up online um, if you would like. There's um, uh, Rodale has popularized this. I don't think they invented it, but they popularized this roller crimper thing. And you see the, 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 you know, the videos with the tractor, you know, driving into this field of ryegrass, standing five feet tall, gone to seed. And they've got this little roller in the front of the tractor, and they've got the corn planter in the back of the tractor. And with one pass, they roll it down, they plant the corn, and when they're done, it looks like this field you where need the rye's all. Planter, pneumatic planter. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because you can't cut rye with their, yeah. But, um, oh, but you can plant with a no-till, like soybeans, instead of mm -hmm. just corn. Yeah. 
Or you could fold but it they if had you're doing it in like a biointensive context. You could just fold it on the back of the machete blade and lay it down. You can take it, a, an it, old, a, a piece of, like a, a, a metal fence post, yeah. and you just throw it down on the ground to step on it, pick it up, throw it down on the ground, step on it, put some string on it to pick it up. You, it doesn't, we're not talking, it needs to be high tech. You literally, or you can take a weed whacker, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's, the thing is, in that stage, it, it will never grow another leaf. It has committed to, it says, okay, I'm knocked up now. It, nothing, any more personal life is off my children. Anybody know about this? <laughs> Don't talk about it. <laughs> right? So it's like, it's shift, there's a hormonal shift that goes on. It will never grow another leaf. You don't need to till it to kill it, is the point. You don't need to till under rye. If you, if you only plant rye in the areas where you're planning on doing your summer crops, my experience has been that the rye goes to seed before the tomatoes are ready to go in and the eggplants and peppers and cucumbers and squash and things like that. So, um, a flail mower not, not running has a big roller in the back and yeah. that, that would be a good roll down thing. My experience has been that yeah, flail mowers or rotary mowers trying to run have a hard time taking out rye. Yeah. But well, you're not well, running. Right <laughs> you're not running. You just we roll it. Yeah. It, like we worked with it. I don't know what happened. It was built with a grant and it had the crimper bars and it was available for use. But then we had to add some weight to it, even with the water filled and the roller. They didn't make the drum big enough. So do they still um, have it here? I mean, I don't know. This was the last time I saw it. Was 2000. Anyway, that's the rudiments of cover crops that I wanted to cover. Um, I think it's really valuable to keep the soil alive and green and growing as many of the months as possible. And when it's not green and growing, there should be something brown laying on the ground, um, if at all possible. We talked about this yesterday. I just want to reinforce that, that concept. Uh, we had the issue this winter with no um, cold, no, not really much cold, not, no snow, that a lot of our cover crop residue that was laying on the ground and mulch residue that was laying on the ground disappeared during the winter. Uh, we had enough go going into the winter that I expected we'd be fine going into the spring, but by February, I was seeing bare soil basically in a lot of places, and I had to come back through with round bales and, and roll, down, roll down mulch because otherwise we're going to go through into the spring with, with bare soil. Yeah. I really, really, really want to go into the spring with something covering the soil. Um, there's a nice correlation with something covering the soil and looseness and earthworms and, and structure and, you don't, and a lack of a need for tillage. Yes. If you're if you're if you're keeping on top of that and you're able to manage covering the soil with mulch yeah. or, yeah. or cover crop, how are you man how are you managing your drip tape under that through that process? Are you um, pulling it up? Are you leaving it there? Uh, I've done both. Uh, depending on um, so, for instance, we just planted salad greens this week outside in the area that was potatoes where there was mulch laying, and we had pulled the we had pulled the drip tape out, and we you know came through with a rake and pulled all the mulch off into the pathways to plant the salad greens, and then I'll put new drip tape down. Um, depending on if you've got drip tape laying down there, um, I have used drip tape over multiple years and gotten away with it. Um, it's a, depends on whether you, you know, how good of a job you do, whether you got rodents in there eating it, uh, how well it gets plugged. Um, there's ways of opening, cleaning up drip tape with, uh, what is it? Um, Rachel, not, 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 uh, Hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you can run hydrogen peroxide and that'll get the scale off that will otherwise sometimes will plug the holes. I've also been known to come through with a nail and just pop new holes with a drip tape um, and leave it there for like usually for three or four years, okay. depending on where I'm at. It's a scale off, it'll take out. Peroxide will take scale off, it'll take out algae and that sort algae. of thing. Sorry, scale, whatever you have to have an acid mm -hmm. like vinegar or citric acid. It'll also work. Yeah, you can run them through. So are, you, are you mulching on top of your drip tape? I put the drip tape down and then mulch in general when I'm putting the crops in the ground, which is where we'll be going once I address a few more of these questions, hopefully. Can I put a plug in for PASA, Pennsylvania Sustainable Agriculture Association, and I'm running a summer conference with Steve Groff. He's the guru yeah. of cover crops that started the tillage radish stuff and did, has Beautiful. done a huge amount with the crimp rye, and he's going to be the main speaker. That'll be in August, I think it is, and in the State College area. Yeah. PASA is a wonderful organization for those who are not aware of it, and decently close by to here, I think, uh, driving distance. <clears throat> uh, we had a question about humates, what they are. Um, um, humates are uh, a mined material. Uh, they're found in the geological profile between peat moss and coal. People understand what coal is. It's just old plant residue that's been pressured over time, and peat moss is old plant residue that hasn't been pressured very long. It's been, you know, anaerobically, you know, stockpiled, basically. but 
between peat moss and coal is this stuff called uh, brown coal or um, <coughs> leonardite. Leonardite is the name of the ore. Um, it generally has a very high humus, humic compound uh, component. Uh, they generally say that I mean, humus is the sort of more stable version of organic matter that's less digestible, less um, likely to to um, oxidize. Not that it won't, but it's much less likely to two than, than organic matter. Uh, compost usually has a humic level of a half percent or one percent or one and a half percent. Humates will have between 70 and 90 percent uh, humus. They generally have that very large bonding capacity in many ways similar to biochar, and, but in other ways not. They don't have this, the porous structure. Uh, they're more fractal in nature, as I understand it. So they're bought, um, you can buy humic acid or fulvic acid, which are components which are solubilized and made, but I generally use just sort of um, you know, crushed, finely, finely ground down to powder size, but mixed, mixed sized humates. You can buy them for relatively short money. So how much do you mix in? Um, to what? Uh, depends what you get. 400 pounds per acre or Leonardite. Is, if you use the extracted material, which is where they extract it with uh, either potassium, sodium, or ammonium hydroxide, that changes the chemical structure of it the hum it humate not your natural molecule, anymore. but it makes it much more available and active. It's it's a molecule. is sort of like a ball. And when you put the hydroxides on it, lays it out like a chain, and every link along that chain will attach and chelate and work with that. There's 16 different modes of action in plants and soils, <laughs> and it's, the Russians have done a lot of research on it. I wouldn't even try growing without it. 12 pounds per acre of the extracted material is the equivalent of 20 tons or one inch of compost per acre in, in activity. What's the brand? Brand I'm using is Teravita. Yes. It's made under Russian patents. Teravita. Yeah, it comes from Russian Organic Approach in Centerville, Lancaster County. You go yeah. online to Teravita, T-R-A-V-I-T-A, -A, two words, and that they have the the 24 pages of the Russian research and explains all how to use it and. What, what concentrations and yeah. what it does, the whole chart the interactions between the soil. <laughs> One of the benefits of having courses like this is you find the people who are local who know a hell of a lot. Because yeah. I'm in and out of here and don't really know that much, but you find the people in the room who do know a lot of things and you can develop relationships with them in the future. Um, always a <laughs> major benefit, I hope, for people. Um, Fungi, but yeah. it, it's a very large molecule, so it's not really good for layer feeding, even though a lot of companies are studying at high levels. Uh, but it can tie up mineral to it. Also. It's like so like biochar; it'll hold it'll hold things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it breaks lock down, up so it's good for the long term. But lock up back atrazine. If you've got, I mean, if you've got toxins in your soil, it's one of the best ways to tie it up. Well, biochar is good too. A very strong pull, big molecule, yeah. a lot of charge. So do you deploy it before your cover crop or before your plant? I put it down with my trace elements. I always want to, you know, I use it as a, as a, as a, as a buffer for my trace elements because I don't want them to be leaching or burning the soil. So I always use um, humates. I would use biochar as well for that purpose. Mm. But I would generally put them down in the fall and, yeah, 500 not, pounds to the acres. It's not critical. You can put down any time. You know, think yeah. if you're using it full early, it's a little bit more critical maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, phosphorus and compost and organic matter. We had a question. Who was it about about uh, high phosphorus levels um, from from compost and also high organic matter levels from compost? And the question is, um, isn't organic matter good? And um, you know, what's, what's the cost benefit analysis with phosphorus versus versus uh, organic matter? Um, <clears throat> Organic matter is definitely good. Uh, certainly when you're operating on a small garden kind of scale, you can put in enough, enough compost to dramatically affect your organic matter. Um, I would like to think that this model over here is your most strategic way of building organic matter. That's just simply through growing healthy plants. Mm -hmm. My idea is that you don't have to add compost to build organic matter, that you can actually just grow healthy plants and they'll fix compost, they'll fix carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, um, 
So, yeah, I generally say if you've got good organic matter levels and high phosphorus levels, that means you probably don't need as much compost as you've been putting on. Um, um, oftentimes people do use compost for the effect of nitrogen uh, availability. I don't think I talked enough about nitrogen yesterday. Um, I made a few comments about it. Um, I didn't talk about molybdenum, which is one of the trace elements critical for nitrogen fixation. I didn't say that in every one of your bean, bean and pea inoculants that you've ever purchased, um, there is molybdenum added. There's a million pounds of molybdenum sold in this country every year mixed into bean and pea inoculant. Many people have never heard of molybdenum. It is an enzyme cofactor. It's a center of the nitrogenase enzyme, which is what is used by the um, azotobacters and the rhizobacters to pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Um, anybody ever seen a urea truck? We used to have urea trucks around here. This looks like a you know big gas truck, like a like a gasoline. The mm -hmm. trucks that are full of gasoline, right? That are full of urea uh, nitrogen. Um, if you do the math, it's something like 8,000 urea trucks floating above every acre of land on the planet. Is how much nitrogen is present in the atmosphere. Mm. 8,000 urea trucks floating above every acre on the planet, full of, full of urea. That's how much nitrogen is in the atmosphere. Um, so the idea is you should not need to add things like compost for the nitrogen, nitrogen purpose. They're really, I mean, a good compost is a wonderful microbial inoculant, which is a really valuable thing. But people who are putting on, putting on compost for the nitrogen purpose, um, you know, my understanding is you get two pounds of molybdenum in every acre and you've got the necessary enzyme cofactors for your plants to be able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, that's really the way you want to be getting nitrogen in is um, having the plants take or, or, or harvest as much as they need when they need it, um, ideally. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, it's it's, it's a, few, a few comments. Um, uh, epi, epigenetics. Sorry, was that a question? You put much stock in just organisms other than the rhizobacter and legumes fixing nitrogen. Thank you. Um, categorically, uh, again, going back to the Russian research, I think it was Krasilnikov, who was the Russian micro micro microbiologist, who said had, he, had, he had identified 2,000 species of nitrogen fixers that were uh, symbiotes with every species of crop plants known to man. Uh, this was done in the 70s. This was, by the time I was born, this was, th this was figured out. Every single plant in the world has evolved with the capacity to get nitrogen from the atmosphere. In the forest, there is no fertilizer being added. Most trees in the forest are not legumes, right? I mean, every single plant has evolved the capacity to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere in critical symbiosis with bacterial and fungal you know, communities. Um, those bacterial fungal communities do need the molybdenum or they need vanadium um, at the center of the nitrogenase enzyme to do that job. So you, those species must be present and the minerals must be present. So when you spray your broad spectrum fungicides or your broad spectrum you know, herbicides or whatever and you kill off these species or you till too much and you leach out these elements, then you don't have what's necessary for them to do it. But if you've got good biological activity and you've got good mineral spectrum, um, you should not need to add nitrogen to your farm. Um, that's my basic philosophical position, which I back up by not adding it on my farm. Um, not saying that I've got full system function on my farm, but um, it's entirely plausible to not be adding nitrogen or to be adding it in very, very, very small quantities. Um, um, yeah. The seed inoculum use has a lot of different features of the like zodobacter and things that will fix nitrogen or non -legion. Non, non, yes, yes, exactly. A good, a good inoculant will have a, a spectrum of these things in it. Yes? Real quick, can you talk about the effect of uh, organic supplies of nitrogen, like chicken manure, or like we buy a chip, pelletized chicken manure, the effect on microbes in the soil? Um, so you're talking about the pelletized, the compost of chicken manure. I made a comment about that yesterday, being that that's like from conventional chicken houses. Right. And so it has all this, you know, Glyphosate and and GMO DNA and and um, antibiotics and growth hormones and everything else. So that's just a fact. Um, <clears throat> uh, the the idea is that when you are feeding your plants nitrogen, or feeding them phosphorus or you know uh, bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, things like that, all of which of course are also byproducts of the conventional ag supply system and all have the you know all those toxins in the bone meal and blood meal and feather meal, even though they are. Certified, I believe, organic. Um, what's that? They are certified. Certified organic and from the conventional supply chain. Just so we're clear. Just so there's no, if you were ignorant and willfully or happily so, you are no longer. 
right? <laughs> um, organic is a system, it's not, yeah, anyways. So the answer to your question is, when you feed your plants nitrogen, then they don't need to feed the soil life or the leaf life to harvest nitrogen. And so you basically, is, I, it's the way I like to think of it is you get your plants addicted to this soluble form, which is, I mean, it's less soluble than other forms, but it's still, um, they don't have to feed their, their uh, microbial community, and so they are, you know, functionally um, more, uh, less resilient. Um, they're, they're addicted to that. They don't have it. When that nitrogen that you've added runs out, they don't have the capacity to make themselves more nitrogen, so they need you to add it, add it to them. Um, this is one of my biggest issues with seed that you buy, yeah. is seed is raised with these things added, and so the mother plants don't have the capacity to do this, and so they haven't passed that capacity on to their children, and when you try to plant their seeds into a system where you're not feeding them this way, they suffer. And it takes them a generation to kick into gear and to learn those skills back again. Um, which is one of my biggest issues on my farm is the seed I buy. Because I'm still buying seed and haven't been saving all my seed, I run up against this issue on an annual basis, is that my plants have not learned from their mothers how to feed themselves. Yeah. Um, it's a real serious issue that I have. Um, but we can go into the broader. Yeah, does that answer the question, mm -hmm. roughly? Yeah. OK. Um, epigenetics. Um, who asked the question about epigenetics? Yes. Just I, wanted, I, I just touched on a it. better definition of what it is and explain it. OK, so I use it. I mean, I, I'm not sure if the exact definition is what, what, what I'm going to use is correct. Um, but it's basically, epigenetics is talking about how environmental conditions affect genetic expression. Um, um, the metaphor I like to use, or the example I like to use, is a pigweed. You guys have pigweed down here, I'm guessing. Um, sure. Have you ever seen a pigweed that germinated sometime in the you know end of April, beginning of May? Um, seen that pigweed in August? You know those ones? Yeah. Like, oh, that is a plant, right? Gorgeous, amazing, six, seven feet tall, like just broad and burly, like millions of seeds. You've seen those pigweeds. Yeah. You've seen the pigweeds that germinated in the end of August. Sometime by the end of September, they've set seed. And they're about yay tall. Seen them? Mm -hmm. That was not different seed stock. The seven foot tall pigweed and the six inch tall pigweed were not different seed stock. The only thing that was different was it germinated in different environmental conditions. One germinated in the spring, late spring, you know, warm soil. Um, short nights, warm nights, and said, haha, I'm going to go for it. It read back into its genetic memory for the past 5,000 generations and said, these conditions look optimal. I'm going to you know, pull out the stops and go for it. The one that germinated in the, in the end of August, nights are starting to get cold, nights are starting to get long, says, uh-oh, frost is coming. Better hurry, out, hurry up and pop out some seed before I get killed. Right? So the plant reads the environment and modulates its, 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 its how it builds itself based on its read of the environment. And um, that's a simple explanation or a simple example which has to do simply with, with the time of the year it germinates. But um, what we can do with nutrition, um, feeding the plant, giving it a broad spectrum of minerals so it's got the enzyme system cofactors, um, you know, inoculating it so mm -hmm. it you know, is setting up symbiotic relationships with other species. Uh, we can really have a profound effect through even just a couple generations of good nutrition on the functional capacity of our plants. Um, um, we talked about the pig yesterday at Iowa State that was, it was a, you know, a beautiful pig and she was fed poorly and her grandchildren were, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever the word is to be polite. I don't want to say anything because it's a little bit too close to humans. Um, and then, you know, two more generations was back up to a much more attractive physiological form. So that's the epigenetic effect. The environmental conditions affect genetic um, expression. Um, so I think that's, a, that's a, rough, a rough explanation of the term, to my understanding. Um, two studies. The Finnish people studied their uh, genetics for about 200 years in connection with diabetes. And yeah. they found that it was the epigenetic factors and not the genetic factors that drove diabetes eruption. It's you categorical. Can search that and you can find it's it. It's categorical. Another um, thing like that is high elevation 
conception produces large heads, large chests, short legs, and people like me. I was conceived about 10,000 feet elevation. Yeah. All of my people are much taller and different structure than my body. Yeah. And I, my body expressed completely differently because of where I was conceived. There are so many subtle attributes that are part of reality that actually, I mean, the thing about science is, is the cause and effect. Right? All, we're do all science is about is like cause and effect and trying to understand it. And there are all these things that happen that we're like, I don't know why it happened. And then we just say, oh, blah, 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 grace of God, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think we can understand these things. There are ways of actually tracking them down and, and, and identifying them. It's, I, it's so exciting when we begin to tease these things out. Um, yeah, I mean, and this is where we talk about the, the moon and where the moon's at in relation to which, you know, sign and all that kind of stuff. I mean, indigenous communities across the planet are pretty categorical about this. Thou shalt not plant when the moon is here. And we're all like, you silly primitive people, right? And they're like, yeah, except there's a whole bunch of us cultures all around the planet who've been watching things for a long time, and we've seen this, and we've noticed this, and we're not paying attention close enough, we haven't seen it yet. Um, there's all kinds of these aspects that are present, and, and, um, and I would suggest that, you know, <coughs> being open to experimenting and, and paying attention to some of these subtler attributes um, can really have an extremely powerful effect in the epigenetic effect on our crops. I think if we work thoughtfully through a few generations of our seeds, we really can profoundly impact in a positive manner their vitality, their functional capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, I do want to continue to move through this list before I get to the agenda. Um, we're almost an hour into the day. Uh, plant visual analysis, we're just going to do that later today, so I'm going to leave it be. Um, No-till and amendments, I think that was a question about um, if you're going to be minimizing tillage or not tilling or, or, broad, or you know, um, working in pastures, how do you get the, the amendments integrated? Um, I use my earthworms. Um, I figure that they're going to be working it into the ground, and so I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. Just another thing, if, um, if we want to start, to, if we want to spread them in the spring, is there yeah. like micronutrients? Uh, do you have to worry about toxicity with the plants? Absolutely. Um, if you are putting your trace elements down in the spring, you want to um, get them in as soon as possible and have as many weeks as you can be between when you put them down and when you get your, your seeds in the ground. It is possible to put your trace elements down and till the soil and plant and not have any problems. The more organic matter you've got, the better. The more you've buffered your trace elements with a carbon source like humates or biochar, the better. Um, if you solubilize your trace elements, if you get soluble grade um, and you solubilize them in water and mix and put in that water some molasses or some humates or some biochar or some sugar and buffer those trace elements with a carbon source and spray it down evenly over the, over the soil, you can really um, break the rules and get away with it. It's there where you get chunks of boron in contact with your bean seed that you're going to get things fried and not working. So um, common sense, the more, the, the, the less time you've got in between putting the trace elements down and planting, the more evenly they need to be spread and the more they need to be buffered with an organic compound to be um, not worried about. <clears throat> Wiregrass and invasives. Um, uh, we call it quack grass, where I come from, I think. We talked about this yesterday. Um, generally, those rhizomy type grass weeds correlate with a tight soil, oftentimes a no air. Um, generally, you have a low calcium levels. Generally, you have low boron levels. Um, um, so uh, there are books that lay out the correlation between weeds and why they grow. There's actually a book called Weeds and Why They Grow, which you know, has identified the plants, the, you know, the, the Latin names, the common names, and the soil test correlations. Um, if you till, till ground when it's wet and it compacts real tight, that's one of the best ways to get quack grass, right? It's the best way to get quack grass, um, and that was because you tilled the ground when it was wet. Uh, it was your fault. And how do you get rid of it is a, is a broader question. Um, you know, generally, if you take, take your soil test, you will see you'll have low boron levels, low calcium levels in those kind of environments. That's been my experience, my understanding. Um, there are different ways of doing it. Um, you can, um, you know, just simply take a black uh, a tarp. Um, you, can, you can starve them to death by not giving them any sunlight, um, depending on what you're doing. You can take landscaping fabric, and you can put that down, and you can just, you know, make holes where you're putting, where you're putting your transplants, and you can plant into it. Um, uh, you can take it out of production and put cover crops that will smother them, like buckwheat or something like that, that will smother them from a lack of sunlight. Um, but, you know, addressing the underlying mineral deficiencies in the soil, I think, is a, a really good way. 
Uh, my understanding is that when you get those sufficient boron levels and calcium levels, the, those kind of plants go away. They are there to help um, open up the soil and get those mineral levels present. Um, and so when you dress those minerals, then, they, then, they, then they're more likely to disappear. Um, I traced one rhizome 22 feet yeah. under my mulch. Wow. Yeah. They're remarkably <laughs> powerful. Is that true for Johnson grass? I'm not sure what Johnson grass is. Is it a rhizome type of grass? Yeah. 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 Rhizome is bigger than your thumb. My understanding is the rhizome, the rhizome grasses um, that generally correlate with tighter, compacted soils are oftentimes correlate with a low boron level and a low calcium level. And getting those boron and calcium levels addressed will create the environment where they're no longer needed and they will wither on the vine, as it were. Um, nature, as we said before, has these plants which are called bioaccumulators, which help rebalance soils. And different plants come in at different times to address different imbalances. Um, it's really quite beautiful the way it works. Uh, we call them invasives, we call them weeds, we call them, you know, um, pests or things like that. And we try to kill them. We don't understand that nature's trying to give us a lesson here. So my thought is understand what they are likely to be bioaccumulators of. And you, if you help to address that imbalance, that will help get those, uh, those plants to, to pass on to the next <coughs> stage. <clears throat> I can't wait to tell my husband I'm not weeding the big flower bed because I'm going to take care of it. <laughs> 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 I'm going to do that this year. Yeah, see what happens. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, with your, with your, with your, uh, yeah. People think that having things all clean and orderly and like no, no stories is beautiful, right? In nature, you've got multiple layers. And we think that no layers is beautiful. Yeah. Like our, the problem is we have a perverse perspective on beauty, as far as I'm con concerned. Yes. And until we change our perspective, we're going to be fighting. Mm -hmm. it's, look at how nature does it. There's, go into the forest, any kind of a decent forest, and you'll, you'll have four or five different canopy layers. Um, and that's what you've got in any kind of a perennial ecosystem. And we just fight that, fight that, fight that, because we think it's not attractive. It's, it's weedy, it's messy, it's unattractive. Um, I don't know how to deal with that. I don't, I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but honestly, the, the general public is just uneducated. They don't know. They only know what they've been taught, and what they've been taught isn't all there is to know. Yeah, so we've been taught reality. that everything should be clean, everything right. should be orderly. In the bathroom, there's this thing you're supposed to wash your hands. Anybody read the sign? Mm -hmm. Sing. A happy ha happy birthday twice while twice. you're washing your hands. I have that in my bathroom because we're gap-approved. I have that sign. Yeah. <laughs> Just so we're clear here, yeah. how many different species are living on your hands? Ballpark. Ten. Yeah. Right. Well, can we say hundreds or at least a hundred different species of people living on your hand? Right. Think about an old growth forest. Old growth forest. Right. Multiple species of plants living in a symbiotic environment. Where do you see invasives taking over an old growth forest? Do you? Yeah. In the old growth forest? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Bitter, bittersweet. Bittersweet comes into places that have been cleaned out that are in rough shape. You don't usually see, when I mean, you don't find old growth forest for starters. Yeah. But um, my understanding is that the, the invasives come into areas that have been disturbed. And so the best way to create an, an environment for the invasives to flourish is to clear cut the old growth forest. <laughs> so when you clear cut the old growth forest, on the way to visit somebody in the hospital who's got, you know, MRSA or Versa, you have created the optimal environment for that invasive to establish. And we understand that concept? Mm -hmm. yes. This is called biological terrain. This is proposed by a contemporary. I don't my hands in the dirt. Yeah. Yeah, um, is the guy's name was what was it? Um, Beauchamp. Antoine Beauchamp was a contemporary of of um, Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Pasteur proposed the germ theory that it was the germs that cause us to get sick. We know that's not true because you've everyone's been in a room where somebody was coughing and sniffing, sniffling, and you got their germs and you didn't get sick, right? Yeah. So if that's happened once. You've been in the presence of someone who's coughing and sniffling and you didn't get sick, then it's not the germs that cause you to get sick. It's the, what Beauchamp said is it's the biological terrain which determines your susceptibility. If your immune system is weak, then the germs can establish 
and make you sick. But if you're vital and vibrant, you're not going to get you know um, get sick in the first place. And so um, they say that on his deathbed, um, Pasteur said, "Beauchamp was right. Um, he was wrong. Pasteurization is not the right way to do things. Right. Right. It's the biological terrain which determines the overall system function." This is what we understand with the, with the microbiome stuff that's coming out finally, 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 because we've got the technology to study it, we can say it's true, right? Instead of looking at nature and understanding the patterns and being able to figure out intuitively how it should work, now we've got the scientists who can look and do the genetics and blah, 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 and say, okay, yes, this does correlate. But um, it's really, as far as I'm concerned, the microbiome, the people living in the, you know, the multiple species living together symbiotically with the, with the parent organism, um, is what you should be aiming for. Um, anyways, that was a little bit of a rant. Um, has something to do with invasives, I guess. So that was on topic. Um, that's my answer to invasives, is they're usually there for a purpose, and usually they're very vital and vibrant and are you know, helping to build soil. Um, anybody know what multiflora rose is? Multiflora rose, you can say that down here? When we bought our farm, it was at least a third multiflora rose. I mean, maybe, uh, probably less than a half, but somewhere in that range. Eight feet tall, like, to the ceiling, yep. you know, a couple hundred miles, you know, not come on, a couple hundred yards, and it's, you know, straight. I went in there with the, with the mini excavator, and you find where the bottom is, and you pull it up, and you yank it, and you shake it, and you throw it in a pile, and the soil was beautiful yep. underneath them. It was dark and rich, and like, God, they did a wonderful job on that soil. Get out of here. <laughs> Just stop screwing with this place. Give us some time. We'll straighten everything out. You get the trees starting to come in underneath them and around, right? Um, what poison ivy? We've got. Um, we talked about the uh, bittersweet, kudzu, all these guys. Um, Japanese knotweed, vibrant, vital, powerful plants, right? They really do help build soil. Um, anyway, so I don't have such a negative opinion on invasives. Uh, my understanding is they are generally present in areas which are disturbed and imbalanced, and if you can help to bring balance back to the system, they will weaken and um, not be necessary in the first place. Um, voles, cats. I have cats. We feed our cats too much. Don't feed your cats. <laughs> cats have evolved with humans for a long time, not as pets. Dogs as well have evolved with humans for a long time, not as pets. They don't really belong in the house. The eastern hognose snake. Mm -hmm. has as its primary food, yeah. mice, moles, voles. And the How more, do we get it back? It's almost gone from Virginia. The more piles of, the more piles of hay and, and brambles and brush and piles Stop and mediating. stuff, areas where it's not flat and mowed, the, a, a pile, an old hay bale sitting in the corner is a wonderful ecosystem, yeah. right? I mean. Just leave things laying around where you're going to need them later and stop cleaning things up so much. Um, and you've got ecosystems where people can establish. The, um, you want to have, you wanna have uh, the, uh, the pollinator habitats, they call them, the, um, the hedgerows, where you've got the, 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 the flowering plants, the herbs, the medicinals, the nuts, the berries, the shrubs, you know, on your perimeters. Um, you, wanna, you need to have multiple layers. You need to have not flat and clean and just one species of grass everywhere. You want to have, you know, a mowed path if you, need, if you need to go from here to there and you don't want to get your pants wet in the spring. But other than that, don't mow it down so much. Don't keep it so, you know, flat. <clears throat> it's real easy. It's you just you don't do mowing. anything. <laughs> what happens is when the mower breaks, you don't fix it. <laughs> you can mow one little path to, no, to walk. Yeah. In my yard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you got a fence to keep the cows out. Yeah. Anyway, you see where I'm going with all this. I don't, I'm not giving you the answers you're looking for, but um, it's okay. <laughs> uh, drainage, compaction. Whose question was that? What was your specific? Um, with, as you noticed, with our soil in this area, about 10 miles from here, the, the heaviness of the clay, the often, I mean, just the compaction that we get. Yeah. And granted, 
I'm working on a tiller system. So yeah. I think there are some things that we've been talking about that will alleviate this. Yeah, hope so. Um, I've been using a subsoiler to try to break through some of that. Yeah. Um, and it seems helpful in spots. This this spot that I was talking about with the cover crop is one of our worst spots. It's a downhill slope that then bowls up. Yeah. Um, last year we had about eight inches of rain and they watched almost all of our root crops was run away. Yeah. Um, we had standing water for four days. Yeah. Um, they call the, that a slew out west. Yeah. The, the tilt in this area is actually really good compared to other areas on our farm, um, but the common Prince Edward County problem here is we have about four inches of topsoil, and, and then we get, and it's an old dairy on to boot, so we have extreme compaction from yeah. the history of the farm. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of things have already been answered. Before. I think I covered a lot of this stuff. I'm just, a couple more points that come to mind. Um, one is, if you, I, the first thing I do on my land, I've done on my land, is look at the lay of the land and see where the ponds want to be. And if you've got a spot that wants to be a pond where water collects, dig it out and let it be a pond. And organize, the lay, organize your growing areas around it. Um, for me, that's foundational. Trying to, you know, till through wet areas because you want to have a 200 foot bed and it's wet right here but it's okay. Um, for me, is like there should be a spring, there should be a stream. This is what the what the land wants, and this is you know, permaculture principle again. Is you work with the water first, and you establish the water, and then you design your beds around that, or your your trees, or or whatever it is around that. That's that's one point. The other one is again the calcium one. I'm not sure what your base saturation percents are on calcium. Um, we talked about this yesterday. I haven't actually seen too many soil tests from around here to get a, a good a good. Um, feel for where things stand, but um, I, what are your, what's your base saturation percent on calcium? Do you know? 46%? 49%. Yeah, your calcium wow. base saturations are too low, that's why your clays are tight. Until you get your calcium levels up, you're going to have tight soil, and you can, all the, all the machinery stuff you can do, this is one of Arden's, Arden Anderson's big things, is about the flocculation of clay with calcium, the uh, petroleum well, you know, petroleum diggers, oil oil drillers have figured this out that you, if you want clay to to open up, you add calcium. If you want clay to tighten up, you add magnesium. When you get the ag lime that is dolomitic lime, that will tighten your soil up. You, I mean, high magnesium levels will cause your clays to be tight, and no amount of work will address that. Um, it's you need to get more calcium into the system. I don't, I'm not sure what your soil tests say if you've got them, but um, those are the two things I would suggest. One thing that Elaine Ingham had said, and something I saw with her that I thought was interesting, I just want to hear your commentary on yeah. it, is that with, she was saying with the subsoiler, she would pump tea. compost tea or something yeah. down below yep. with that, Absolutely. as far down as possible. You want to get your inoculants down there, you want to get your seeds down there, this is when you, you, you run your, your, your you know, a seed. You would drop your cover crop seed right in that in that slit to help get those roots down there and get life down there and get organic matter down there. Absolutely, um, but I think calcium is really important. I think if you don't get your calciums up over time, you're you're just you're, they're never gonna they're never gonna flocculate. The clays are gonna be tight. That's what Gary Zimmer does. He does a subsoil and works everything down through that slot. Yep. And and then move, plants right there, and then moves it over. Move it next over a foot, year, six a foot, inches. And then yeah. the foot over until you're three or four feet over, and you're back to where you were, and then the whole yeah. field is done. Yeah, exactly. Right? Put the you know biology and the air in there to support the biology and the minerals. You, you know, put the inoculants on the seed, and you have you, you have a seed box behind the behind the subsoiler. You just drop that seed right in the slot. Yeah, absolutely. And they've got somewhere to reach down there. You put your, your forage radishes and things like that, and you drop them right there in that slit. Um, inoculate it beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Is it insane? We've got six spots that are about 50 feet wide, uh, 100, maybe 125 feet long, to put on, to plant all of it right now because we're just getting going. What radishes are they called? The forage, the daikon radishes. Yeah. I mean, to plant all that to get matter and you know, to bring back the soil and to break it up, to plant all six spots in those daikon radishes? No. And I wouldn't do not. just daikons. Okay. I mean, the thing is you want to have as many species, as, if you're going to be doing cover crops and not growing, not growing food crops, as it were, do as broad a spectrum as possible. Look okay. up the term, you know, um, 
uh, cocktail cover crop. The cocktail, right. And okay. get them okay. get them established, and yeah, do the fallow periods, and and you know, run. You can maybe do two, maybe maybe three different um, successions of cover crops during during the year. Okay. In that spot. I think the radish won't work now. It'll go to seed because it doesn't make the root. You have to put it in late in August, August, middle of September yeah. at the latest. July, you don't put them in. We put them in, yeah. in July, otherwise they don't get a chance to. Yeah, well, it's too cold. We're a little colder about a month. A little less colder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't even get the zero down if, here. If they get in by the beginning of October, they grow, but they oh. full tops, but they don't really make much roots on them. I can. May I say something about of course, like the please. And the yes, yes. Calcium and the flocculation that I've kind of heard. I learned all from Elaine kind of that oh, the fungi are all calcium carbonate. You want to flocculate your clays, you do it with fungi, and uh, I then merged the minerals and the, and the biology, and they work better integrated. Mm -hmm. But I have seen even without adding any calcium, um, just doing the mob grazing, like tromping down carbon and feeding those fungi and getting the, the plant roots and the fungal network, that the clay can actually go to where you can just stick your hand in it, and it's. We have a video, I don't, is it on the website? It was, it may be on our website still, it, where we, where I talk about the calcium carbonate and the flocculation and how it basically changes the clay electrical charge. And I've seen it, I've, I've done it on a lot of different farms without adding calcium, but yeah. by, by supporting the fungi and the plant roots and the sugars, you know, mm -hmm. um, somehow that seems to there's multiple modes, work. multiple In paths to the top of the mountain. Yeah, and so I'm really eager to um, look at the calcium part of it with our farm because we've got a really tight clay farm. Nice and, nice and tight. Yeah. <laughs> Good old worn out ground. <laughs> <laughs> Beat to death. <laughs> Coming along real nice though. All right, drainage compaction. Um, bricks in. Salad greens, that was the question about lettuce and Asian greens, and how do you raise the bricks levels? Um, I'm going to leave that one on because we're going to talk about bricks later today. Um, That's rock phosphate side. I'm going down this way. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. you got to wait for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Fruit tree nutrition and disease. Whose question was that? Here, I All right, we'll come back in a second. And economics of small scale. That was somebody back over here. Oh, you too. I didn't ask the question. Okay. Um, Is he here today? Uh, maybe I can do a third there. of an acre. That's pretty small. Yeah. Um, like I said yesterday, I think I made $700 on a couple thousand square feet yet on Thursday. Uh, it was just one picking. Um, um, yeah, I think uh, you can do amazing amounts of production on small scale. A uh, third of an acre, quarter of an acre. Um, you can do you can just do, you can do remarkable amounts. I'm not sure how many thousand dollars you're looking for, exactly. Yes, that guy from Canada, um, I can't remember his name, John um, Martin, Martin Portier is um, doing. Um, you know, I mean, the the number that a number of people are doing is uh, around 100 grand an acre. Um, you know, on a couple acres. There's people out in California doing it. There's um, what's his name in Connecticut's doing it for sure. Um, uh, those guys are doing about 100 grand an acre, um, fairly fairly. Regularly. Gross revenue. Gross revenue. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> what everyone wants to talk about is revenue. Yeah. There's, there's a guy in Canada up in D.C. He, I, he came out with a book not too long ago, but um, I think it's the urban farmer. He has a third of an acre. Claims to make 80,000 on that third of an acre. Yeah. Um, Curtis said. Gross. Yeah. Revenue. Gross. What's his well, does he have? On I mean, a third of an acre, you don't need to hire yeah. anybody, and your expenses are really small. Yeah. Right. This is the thing about operating at a human scale. Is it? I mean, for me, it's like between one and a half and three acres is is about any all anybody should ever endeavor to take, take on. on. Yeah. Right. I mean, acre and a half to three acres. If you're talking about a full time being a farmer, you know, that's your scale. That seems to be like there's a there's different scales. I, as I travel around the country, there's different scales that I see. There's the homesteader people who are trying to make a living on a small amount of land. Usually they're doing an acre and a half, maybe up to three. One and a half to two seems to be like a pretty sweet spot there for people who want to do vegetables fairly intensively and make a living on it and feed their families. And then there's the people who are actually going to be farmers, quote unquote, and they're doing 10, 20, 40, 50 acres of vegetables. They're the ones running machinery. They're the ones doing tillage. They're the ones hiring staff. 
they're the ones with the major overhead expenses, right? As soon as you start paying staff, you start to pay taxes, you start to get the government involved, you got to pay. I mean, there's just all kinds of hassle once you get above that, you know, two, three acre scale. So, um, my experience is, you know, that's when you start to get take out the debt. That's when you start to have to have machinery. That's when you ha have to, you know, buy more land, and then there's all this other kind of logistical um, stuff involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. I didn't fully hear the question about the urban farmer, but. Um, I've corresponded with Curtis Stone quite a bit through email. If anybody has any questions about his operation, I can talk to you. The about guy it. in BC. Yeah. I do that. He has tons I, of information online, yeah. too. He always yeah. does like a weekly video called the blog post. And He's actually got seven full time employees on that little urban spot. Wow. Thing. He yeah. does. He does several backyards, though. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what's his name down here in Virginia? Joel Salatin. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. The suit, Virginia. The more well you do, the, on, the more money you make, the more people you can hire, the more you can support your local community. So depending on what your objectives are and where you're going with this kind of thing, like, I mean, I was walking her land yesterday. I was like, 500 acres. Oh, my God. So much opportunity. Right? Like, but. It's 230 openings. It's 500 acres. It's 480. Well, whatever. <laughs> it's 500 acres. It's, it's, round. it's like, it's round. oh my God. I don't know. It may not, it, it was last surveyed in the 1600s. Who knows how big it is? But it's a big piece of land, and there's so much you can do if you do the, the integrated systems and the multiples, the trees and the animals and the four leggeds and the two leggeds and the, and the, you know, the berries and the nuts and the, and the annuals and the herbs, the fish. There's, there's so much you can do. There's so much production possibility. Um, this is what's so exciting about this whole thing is smallholders are the ones that actually do feed the land, feed the, pe feed the, feed the planet, right? right? Most food comes from smallholders that aren't in the system, right? It's, it's the, it's the, those, those people are the ones that are, always have fed humanity. And um, I say, you know, get out of the city, occupy the land, um, you know, stop engaging in the system that's the problem. Every time you put your energy into it, in, in the more dependent you are on the system, the more you're part of the problem. Right? We're animals, we belong in the land. You know, get out of the system as much as you can. Get grounded in the land. You can make an awesome living. You can have a wonderful quality of life. You actually begin to have relationships with your community. I mean, I think we actually do solve a lot of these deeper systemic problems by doing this fairly small scale on the land, you know, more integrated stuff. I mean, Elliot Coleman's another one who's making good money. You know, 100 grand an acre is a, seems like a pretty decent um, target to be expecting. Um, and then you, sh you can afford to pay people, See? right? And you bring in people yeah. who want to have their own land, yeah. and you've got a functioning system, and you've got a high-end, you know, like a training model where they come in for a year, and they can run a high-end system, and they can learn all these different skills, and then they can go and be empowered to do it themselves and train more people. Um, Cliff Slate and Sir, that's mm -hmm. where we were at the other day. Um, we met him through VSU. He promotes the 43560. Whatever the, whatever. Yeah, whatever square foot an acre is. Yes, anyway. one acre. Yeah, oh, a dollar, no, a dollar yeah. square foot is what he promotes. Yeah. So if you, he figures ten thousand dollars in expenses and costs of the forty-three thousand. Yeah. So he's making uh, netting grossly uh, thirty, netting 30, 30 35 an acre, an acre. Roughly. Yeah. And he experiments with different things, and he goes back and plants in between his rows other uh, produce like onions to pick up the dollar per square foot. But anyway. He, does, he has organic and non-organic. Yeah, you don't so need to be organic. Yeah. Now, so, one so, question for you. Would you sell from your farm? Is it through CSAs, farmers markets, restaurants, stores, what? I do not do res uh, I do not do CSAs and do not do farmers markets. Okay. Um, I grew up doing CSAs and farmers markets, and I found them to be profoundly unlucrative. Um, <laughs> if you do them on scale, that's a different situation. But if you're doing it on a smaller operation, I find restaurants and health food stores, um, those are my major, um, I mean, restaurants are my major major customer base. Okay. Um, uh, health food stores is a local retreat center. Um, uh, we have a couple sort of um, buying clubs, like milk buying clubs, you know the milk clubs that people yeah. have that for raw milk? So yeah. there's already 10 families that are getting together. We email them a list of what we've got. They place their order. We come and drop it off. It's kind of like the restaurant. It's just like a boom, drop it off. We grow what? We grow everything for ourselves, right? Because we're feeding the family first. Mm -hmm. But most things we don't sell. I mean, we only grow, we only sell crops we can make good money on. Um, like if you put your summer squash in once and you just pick it every two days, 
and you pick it at all all summer long, like great, people want their summer squash. You got, you know, hundred pounds, hundred fifty pounds coming in a week at two bucks a pound, that's three hundred bucks on summer squash. Done. Well, three hundred bucks a week, that counts as money. You know? Now pole beans, you put them in once, you pick them you pick them every couple couple days, you you're getting, you know, twenty, thirty pounds every every couple of days through three 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 fifty a pound, you know you got another hundred bucks on pole beans. Like um, tomatoes, they only run in for two, three months, but when they're in, you're I mean phew. Um, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's like, what are the crops that people will buy that they're used to that you can make a good return on, don't take a lot of effort as far as, you know, logistical timing and kale and chard and collards and, you know, like, just go out there and pick them and then you go out and pick them again, then you go out and pick them again, then you go out and pick them again. Each time you pick them, you're making 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Like, it's just, you put them in and then that's it. You just, you just go out and pick them. So, um, some stuff. I mean, potatoes. You know, if I got enough space to run potatoes, I can sell all the potatoes I can grow for a buck fifty a pound. Um, you know, you can grow a lot of potatoes on an acre. I don't do an acre of potatoes. Uh, carrots and beets. I do. A, I do some during the growing season. They take a little more effort. But in the, you know, I, I grow them for the winter for for stick them in the root cellar. And then carrots and beets and potatoes people want all winter long, and they'll buy carrots and beet potatoes. They won't buy turnips. They won't buy rutabagas. They won't buy daikons. You know, yeah. Um, but if you got carrots, you got beets, you got potatoes, people will buy them until they're gone. So um, I try to grow things that I can know I can put in. I don't have to worry much about, um, and and I can I can um, not hassle with a CSA with 30 crops mm -hmm. over 20 weeks is a ton of effort, and it's just this you know massive energy and then no energy and then uh, I like the slow, steady cash flow well, model. You see, my wife and I were talking. I'm glad you brought quality of life about yeah. not working sun up. The farmers think, hey, I'm, I'm proud, I'm loud, I'm proud. I'm going to work from sun up to sundown. I'm going to kill Seven myself. Seven days a week. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean there's more yeah. to life than working all the time. I Last mean, I the checked. reason we want to transfer back to the farm is because we're tired of all this corporate crap. You've been working all the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, working working day, so you know. I'm glad you pointed out about quality of life and spending time with the family because, yeah. you know, other people are enjoying life, and the rest of us are taking a bunch of their ass, feeding everybody, yeah. and you know, talking about that. But, but you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, um, so when I'm, I'm out there, when I'm out there, I'm out there with my kids, saying, running around. It's more like right. right. being a farmer, working yourself to death. That that gets old, you know. I've it's been there. I've done it. Yeah. I grew up doing it. I I, I I I did that working working all day thing when I was a kid. And I don't I don't, I can't handle being in a building, sitting right. down with a screen working for somebody else, doing something that feels like it's selling my soul. I can't do it. Tried it, it like sucked my life force, can't do it. Like I love being outside, I love being my own master, but I don't like to work. Like I like to putter. I like to walk around, I like to play with my kids, I like to, you know, clerking. It sounds almost vulgar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, Enjoy it. I'm glad you that out. Hey, you know, you got time, you're outside. <laughs> My great uncle had this exactly. philosophy. He says, I don't work, I just play like I'm working. It's a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Anyway, um, it is 11 o'clock almost, and I haven't even touched the handout. So I thoroughly enjoy the engagement and the dynamic and the, and the camaraderie. I'm going to have to move with some alacrity when we get there. Um, economics of small scale, was that what, the, what that was? Yeah. Um, human effects of qu of quality. Talking about human health, I think we'll t touch on that later today. Um, perennials and guilds. That was your question. Um, polycultures. I talked about. I think I touched on that to a decent degree. Um, um, I haven't studied the companion planting literature as well as I should to know what goes with whom. Um, I definitely do. Uh, you know a lot of plants, families growing in close proximity together, if not immediately together. Um, do you have small fruits or orchards, and what are you putting under them? Um, I am only getting it established. Um, I'm thinking of, of, of um, guilds as far as annuals growing. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, you, can put comfort, you can put herbs in with all your annuals. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the literature. There's books out there that have this yeah. written down. Okay. Um, I, have, I have. If anybody's interested, um, I have Dave Jackie spoken to his workshop on edible forest gardening. Yeah, which is one of the best sort of encyclopedias. Perennial gardening. Yeah, it's an encyclopedia. It's, it's encyclopedia. Got a lot of charts of your fruit trees, like with yeah. I can't remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If 
She just wants a companion planting for garden. John Jeevens grow more yep. vegetables. Put in there. Yeah. I've got that book. Anybody I don't agree with his spacing, but a lot of wisdom he's got. We'll talk about spacing in a little bit. Uh, bricks and nutrition. Whose question was that? Was there a specific question behind it? It's the process over time of getting better and better at bricks. How mm -hmm. does that work? You were um, talking about this afternoon. Maybe? It's on the agenda for today if All we right. get to it. Um, powdery mildew and basil. Yeah. That's one of the you know new new problems. New problems. Right there with late blight. And you guys heard about this one. Um, Drosophila? You said Drosophila yet? Yes. Yeah, Potting Drosophila that sucks the juice out of your small fruits. Mm -hmm. um, Massive mass nutrition will take care of. Categorically. Categorically. No, um, I don't know about the basil. The no, first, so first, first slide. Basil, Saving your seeds. It's a store bought seed. The store bought seed is crap. Um, it's real simple. Yeah, we it's, save our seeds and we have, we have basil like this. And in the middle of August, everybody else's is dead, and yours is doing fine. We're still rolling. Rolling. Cruising. Yeah. Seed quality. So many of our systemic issues go back to the stuff I was talking about yesterday. So many of our systemic issues. You don't have the critical elements for the enzyme system function. You don't have the biology for the, you know, for the symbiosis. You don't have the, the seed quality, right? I mean, we have this, it's, a lot of this stuff is really rudimentary. You are not maintaining hydration. You're not maintaining aeration. Your soil is too compacted. You don't, your soil is not covered. When you begin to address these systemic issues, these systemic you know, pieces, then a lot of your underlying issues disappear. And your issues are not going to disappear until you address these issues. That's my perspective. You can't focus on the, on the symptom. You need to focus on the cause. And the causes for so many of the problems are, are similar. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the basic conjunction. Can you clarify on your basil seed saving? Did you do that before you had powdery milk? Were you already doing that before you, the powdery milk problem came in, or you, after it came in, did you start? If it came saving? in, I wouldn't save the seeds. I had, I have basil in three different places on the farm, and I bought a bunch of seed, and I ended up with the problem. But I had other areas, same, same dirt. Kind of thing because I'm a tunnel, drama tunnel. Used my own saved seed on that, and I had no problems. Yeah. So I destroyed all of the stuff that was over where I had the powdery mildew, and it's. I and now and now you don't have it. This the is. I mean, you get is so bad. Seed is. I'm down south. I'm not supposed to use vulgarities. I'm not going to use vulgarities. At least we try to keep it under. Yeah. There's a real problem with seed. Uh, I'll just say one example. Well, I'll use late blight as a similar type of very virulent issue that a lot of people struggle with. We had late blight come in first in 2009. We blended on coming, so things that come up from down south. I'm not sure where exactly, Alabama or something. Um, but um, UMass told us to take big, you know, tr um, construction trash bags and you know drop them over our tomato plants and zip tie them and cut them off and take them to the dump or bury them or burn them, and that would somehow remove the spores from the environment, which is one of the most stupid suggestions. Does anybody not know how spores work? Right? Off she goes, 500 million of them, right? Stupid. Anyways, so we have this fear of disease thing. It's a part of the, it's part of the germ theory paradigm, which is wrong, right? Only when you're weak and susceptible is there an issue. So we had this big issue. Everybody was all worked up about it. That year at our annual summer conference, I was on a panel um, with somebody from Cornell, somebody from UMass, Paul Stamets was there, and you know, and I was like, I took pictures of my tomatoes the day before and put them up on the screen, said, here's my tomato plants. They're, you know, everybody was like, oh, well, the blight hasn't gotten to you yet. Um, so I didn't get the blight that year until October. You know, a week or two before the frost, it was getting down to the you know, low 40s, high, high 30s. The blight came in, it got my plants. Then the frost came and killed them. I pulled the plants up, brought them into my hoop house, and left them all in the hoop house because I wanted to give my tomato plants blight next year to prove there's nothing to be afraid of, which is exactly what I did. I planted my salad greens in the winter. When they were done, I transplanted my tomato seedlings in. And then once I transplanted my tomato seedlings in, I didn't water them. I wanted to stress them out and get, until they got sick. I waited. There's videotapes. There's, there's like YouTubes of me in this tomato house a couple months later 
showing you how to take a conductivity meter reading and a bricks reading. And these tomato plants are six, seven feet tall and the green leaves bottom to the top. Those tomato plants, three weeks after I put them in, got blight. I waited until a bunch of the plants were dead, till they melted right off. And a bunch more of them had their arms falling off. You guys seen the blight, how it works? It sort of melts right through the leaf, right? I waited until I had a serious case of blight in that hoop house. And then I fed my plants. I didn't do anything besides feed them. I gave them minerals, I gave them inoculants, I gave them hardcore, heavy duty. What's the heaviest duty thing to do? Essential oils. Love. Well, of course, love. <laughs> essential oils. A mix of essential oils. You're going to talk about this this afternoon, right? No. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> I get it from Agridynamics. There's one called uh, PhytoGuard, which is a mix of like eight different essential oils. Jerry Brunetti put it together. There's Company antifungal, again. antimicrobial. What's that? Company again, what did you just say? Agri-Dynamics. They are, if you join the organization, it's one of the things in the Mineral Depot. We can get it for you at, you know, distributor prices. Um, that's the whole deal is we get things at um, prices that are below retail. Nice, right? Yeah, PhytoGuard, I think, is the product. Um, there were various versions of it he's put together, but this one is a, is a sort of a comprehensive for insects, for diseases. Um, essential oils, we know about essential oils and their, and their functional capacities as antimicrobial, antifungal, right, immune system support. The essential oils are those compounds which make the plants indigestible to the fungi in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I inoculate, I gave them foliar inoculants, mm -hmm. I gave them mic micronized minerals, some seawater, some you know, humates, some molasses, some trace elements, um, and I used essential oils, and I think it was about 10 days until the blight was totally gone. Absolutely, totally gone from the house. Wow. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. People are afraid of disease when they really should take responsibility for feeding their plants. The like, it's our fault. Yeah. We're, we're bad parents. We are raising sick children, and we're blaming the environment for our children getting, you know, diseased. It's our fault because we're not creating, we're not doing a good job of raising healthy children, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, there's, and we can understand these different attributes of how to do a better job. Um, and some of it's going to take a year or two to get the system in place, like seed. Seed is not easy. You can buy inoculants, you can't buy good seed. So you know somebody who's got it and you can wheedle some off of them. Right? Yes. Okay. Maybe everybody else in this room knows this. But you keep saying, like a little while ago, you add seawater. Yeah. All right, so. It's on the agenda in a minute. Okay. When I get done with this list, I mean, I'll tell you how to make. You run down to the beach and you pick up a little bit. I'll tell you how to do it yourself. Okay. And I'll tell you what I buy, which is that somebody did it for me. Okay. Either way, you can make it yourself or you can buy it. Totally easy. Nutrients to put in the ground, I hope we covered that to some decent degree yesterday. Shale and lime, I think that was talking about various different kinds of rock dust that are available locally and what the benefits are. And I might have said before, if I didn't say it, basalt is generally the best kind of rock dust to look for. So there's granites, there's basalts, there's all kinds of different types of rock dust. Generally, your broadest spectrum of nutrients is in your basalts. Uh, we talked about how I can't give you a specific answer because I don't know what's going on. Local rocks, rocks for local crops and basalt, that's probably the same conversation. You got something you want to say, say it. Uh, high tunnels, your question? I'll please you when you got specific ones. Rock phosphate? You didn't cover nutrients and how much to put in. As far as foliar sprays and all that kind of stuff is concerned? Maybe. If I don't, you can ask me more questions. Um, there's a question about rock phosphate specifically? Yes? Um, just that, just to lead back to high tunnels, one of the things that I do is manage a medicinal plants nursery. Yeah. And as we're talking, I'm just, I don't really have a question articulated yet, but um, if you have anything about managing nursery stock, because, I mean, I'm often thinking, like, how is, how do I, how do I work and keep the biology alive in this pot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> when it's walled off from everything else. Uh, we're going to talk about roots and top and bottom and nurseries and... I do a ton of like compost tea and vermicompost application and make our potting soil vermicompost. This guy works on... on this, you know this guy with the yellow shirt? You should talk to him. I mean, I've got some thoughts, but the more people meet each other and talk to each other and have time for longer conversations, the better. Um, I, you know, when's the last time a tree picked itself up, chopped its roots off, um, cut its head off, screwed somebody else's head on, and moved over and, you know, screwed into the ground in a different spot. 
<laughs> it doesn't seem natural to me, right? As a farmer who wants to put in a whole bunch of trees and doesn't want to pay $15 a pop, um, I've got a number of thoughts about this topic, but I, um, I think that they should germinate in the ground um, personally, so I don't want to put you out of business. But <laughs> not your business, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, bare roots I think are really bad. Um, you know, I think the top and bottom balance is really important. We'll talk about that today. Uh, we, well, I'll, I'll touch on some of this stuff as I can. Um, yeah. Different scale for how much I should put on. Yeah. On a thousand square feet. So, so what I say is take your soil test, and your soil mm -hmm. test, the target level there for phosphorus is 75 parts per million. And we know that on the, on the thing from yesterday it said that rock phosphate is 20% phosphorus. Um, so you can do your math on how many pounds of actual phosphorus you need in that soil. And I was using it for the calcium. Well, it's 20% calcium as well. Right. So I should but it also has calcium. a bunch of other traces. Yeah. Um, um, you've got other, you've got multiple things you can work with, you know, and I, I think I have a decent, decently laid out there on the, on the handout from yesterday of what the percents are, which element, and which, which material. I should look at the percentages when I'm using it. If you want to figure out math and say how much do I actually need, um, then that was, that's the whole principle behind what I was doing yesterday. Um, it's available over such a long period of time, you don't have to worry about getting too much. Reeves always said, put down a thousand pounds per acre with two thousand pounds of calcium yeah. on top of it because of the phosphorus floats up. Phosphorus and the goes up and the calcium goes, goes down, down and, and the energy and released. They'll, they'll connect together and raise like like in the calcium. soil and fluff it up. Yep. Huh? I have a calcium deficiency, obviously, and I rock phosphate was suggested. Yeah, well, it has, yeah, it has a fair amount of calcium, calcium in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 